and good evening to all the attendees around the globe. This is Prekshi Vyas. I'm a software engineer at Society General. And I started my journey with Airflow around two years ago. And I'm very, very glad to be a part of this talk and learn a lot from the speakers. Hello, everyone. My name is Aladdin. I'm product owner and service manager of Airflow Future Team at Society General. Society General is one of the leading financial services company in Europe. And we are working on the uh, private cloud solution and the Societe General. And I'm going today to tell you another story. This is the third year coming to the Airflow Summit and to give you a return on experience about our Airflow implementation. So tonight I'm going to tell you about how we are building this solution, how we are running it, and how we are maintaining it. So as you see in the picture, we are going to talk about containers. We are going to talk about Kubernetes. So to start from the beginning, I'm going to give you a brief uh, or small picture about how we are implementing this solution. So we are providing um, a managed services of Apache Airflow inside Societe General and we are providing this service on demand. So every user can go to an API or a, a portal where after authentication, he can create, manage, or delete his Airflow instances. So once he created it, we call that a resource plane. So this resource plane is used over an authentication of um, what we call a UAM or LDAP and we can deploy our code on that uh, resource plane or we can uh, execute that workflows. So to go back to that asynchronous system that you see in the schema, we are using uh, Apache Airflow to consume uh, Airflow. So we write uh, some workflows to create, delete, and manage that Airflow instances. And we are doing what we call uh, eating our own dog food for multiple reasons. The most important one is that we are consuming our service, and this allows us to be uh, proactive in case of bugs or in case of problems. And the second reason is to identify the best practices and share it with our users. So to use our service, uh, here is a small presentation of a user journey. So the users can start by creating their own sandbox. The sandbox is just a small recipes that allow users to get uh, a dev environment that can make them be able to uh, develop quickly their workflows in some minutes. In less than one hour, I can be able to start writing my DAGs. I can connect my ID directly to that environment. And once I completed my development, I can push that to, uh, for example, GitHub or package that system or files to S3 bucket. Uh, I can implement my CI pipeline where I can write my, my, my testing. And then I go to uh, the cloud orchestration service. I order my dev environment. I can combine multiple development for me or my colleague or my team. I will combine them together and I will check if it's working fine or not. Once I, do, I did my, my development validation, I'm going to, sorry, uh, functional validation where I'm going to test if the futures are working correctly. I, if I can do a scale of my parallelism, if my futures are working as expected. And finally, I can go to uh, production deployment to push that workflow to uh, production. Uh, a brief overview of the architecture of uh, our offer. We choose it, what we call a share nothing pattern. We have the image. So this pattern allows us to get uh, the possibility to offer service with multiple regions. Every region have a multiple availability zones. Every availability zone have pods deployed on each part. And 
and we are providing a cluster database. It's a Postgres database. In case of failure, we can do a failover automatically. And on the other side, we have a replicated uh, RabbitMQ cluster where we have a queue mirroring. So when we talk about shared nothing model, so on the other side, we have the same uh, schema. And the user can decide to deploy his workflow on both sides with maybe different configurations. And at some level, if they need to do a disaster recovery exercise or to do any failover, they can do it by themselves. So they are autonomous. Uh, this solution is still limited because we can enhance it by getting a multi-regional replication of the database. It's under study. We're already discussing with multiple partners to get that available. So maybe it can be one of the subject of the next talks. So I will give the hand to Prikshi. The floor is yours. Yeah. So thank you, Aladdin. Let's now uh, look at how we manage different airflow flavors and their build within SG. So within Society General, we follow uh, different airflow version life cycles, as you can see the different stages here. So from beta to recommended to obsolete with active and deprecated as the transition stages. We are not exactly following the same timeline as that of the community. For example, airflow version 110.12 was uh, deprecated long back from the community. But within SG, we have deprecated it just a month ago due to several production purposes because there's a lot of things that go behind migrations. Now, talking about the build mechanism, earlier we had a system of Git where each Airflow version um, was had a dedicated main branch. So for example, we had a dedicated branch for Airflow version 1 with Python 3.7. We had a dedicated branch for Airflow version 2 with Python 3.7. And let's say, for example, if someone wants to uh, create a new image, a new flavor with airflow 2.2.4, uh, all we need to do is refactor the version values in the Docker files and uh, with that, uh, update the constraints list. And then it would follow uh, the conventional pipelines. And finally, it would go for the release of the image. If everything is well and the release is successful, uh, then the next step would be to really validate that released image of the new flavor with our internal Helm charts. Now, this system had its drawbacks because there was a lot of manual refactoring, manual updation required, and of course, the manual tests. So we built a more sophisticated solution to combat this, where we again use Jenkins, but this time, we had a lot of parameters that we made dynamic, like starting from the send to S version, Python version, Airflow version. Uh, we would store the constraints list given to us by the community on an S3 bucket. And then we would build the SG hardened images based on these parameters. Then we would perform tests after that. And once we have uh, the image good, we can pass in also an optional parameter for the Helm chart version. Uh, then we deploy this Helm chart on our namespace. And after that, we perform tests on the deployed Airflow services. And if everything goes well, we push this image to a production DTR. And we also perform some security checks, some vulnerability checks. And finally, as the last step, we have uh, human validation. This is just to see all the new features, the new improvements with Airflow to get the feel and experience of the new flavor. Once all that is done, we, uh, we are ready to expose that flavor to our users at SG. So this really helped us a lot and reduced a lot of manual efforts for us and allowed us to really give flavors quite fast. Let's, let's look at now the uh, closer look at the containers and the pods. 
So typically we have namespace as a service. It's one of our dependencies of Kubernetes. We deploy Airflow services using Helm over it. Let's look at a typical deployment of web server, for example. So here we have a web server deployment and the main container is obviously the web server. And we also have the sidecar containers, which is the auto sync for syncing the customer artifacts. We have Fluent Bit, which helps us in shipping logs to Data Lake. And then we have Clean Log, which is a log rotation mechanism on the ephemeral storage. And similar to this, we have the other services that are deployed such as the worker scheduler. And something to notice here is really the deployment API. This is not the native F, uh, API of Airflow, but it's an internal API that we provide to our users so that they can trigger deployments of their DAGs, plugins, et cetera. And then we have other services uh, like StatsD. Uh, StatsD is there, and then we have uh, yeah, Telegraph. So all of these are related to handling the metrics. We will cover these as well in details. And we also have controller, which works very closely with the deployment API in order to facilitate deployments. Now, let's take a deeper look at how exactly the deployments API and the controller work together to um, enable users to deploy their DAGs and plugins. So here we have, as we talked, the API, the controller, and the other Airflow services. And now the client can uh, pass in his payload certain values, uh, like he can pass the uh, Git URL, the Python packages, the system packages, environment variables that he wants to tweak. And once this request is triggered, the controller will register this request. It will use scaffold, which is an uh, online which is a um, build tool to really build these images based on these inputs and then proceed to do a push to the production DTR using dev to prod Once this image is released, uh, the image, uh, the released image is used to upgrade the Helm chart and upgrade the Airflow services on the current namespace. So this is how a typical deployment process of the user is carried out. And later the user can really use the ID of that deployment to get the status. Even if the deployment fails, uh, we allow the user to get some logs of the reason of the failure and all those things. So let's now move on to the next one, which is a philosophy that we follow. It's you build it, you run it. So, so far we have talked about the different kinds of builds, different kinds of features that we have developed. And now the other important aspect of our service is run. And by run, I really mean uh, the maintain, the tools the minimum tooling that we have to maintain our service uh, to a large amount of users. So just to talk a little bit about our uh, team, we uh, have uh, two support engineers on a rotation basis versus approximately 70 teams. So we are able to handle this ratio of two is to 70 uh, by maintaining a perfect balance between the build and the run. What I mean by that is if there is any uh, there's any emergency fix that we need to do, or there's a need to really stabilize our service, which is having a lot of issues. We pull some velocity right from the build into the run. And once the service is stabilized, we go back to the build. So this sort of balance that we maintain really allows us to handle all our clients and keep them happy. So uh, talking about run, uh, we have, something called observability that is the tooling that helps us manage and maintain and there are three main things under this there's logging there's metrics and there are events and this really gives us a lot of visibility on what's happening with uh, the users instances what's happening with our own service and all those things so let's uh, go a little bit into the logging part so first we have our system logs. Uh, this is the logs of uh, the various services like web server, scheduler, even flower, and of course the worker. So here, as you see, we have a sidecar container, Fluent Bit, which we use uh, in order to collect and parse the logs from the ephemeral storage. And it sends that 
to uh, the metrology. Now, metrology is a private cloud service within SG, which is essentially a place where all sorts of technical data are collected, and then it can be viewed on a dashboard like Kibana. So this really allows users to uh, see what's happening in their services and uh, for them to debug their workflows by themselves and provide autonomy to the users. So the next we have task logs. So just like system logs, task logs are very important for users. And we use the inbuilt uh, support that uh, Airflow offers for S3 connection. And the worker uploads those logs to S3 and the web server fetches them to display them on the log task log view. Now, let's move on to the second aspect, which is monitoring the user requests. Now, as Aladdin mentioned, we have uh, different API operations that we handle uh, using uh, the backend Airflow workflows, like there's create, there is delete, there is manage to start, stop, restart, there is auto recovery. All of these requests are really managed uh, or, or monitored on this dashboard that is developed by us. And apart from monitoring requests, we also really monitor the consumption here. So uh, if you can go back, yeah, thank you. So in the in the consumption part, we really try to uh, see that we are not over consuming any resources, we are not crossing the quota, and we are keeping in check the capacity planning uh, for our service. So that's also another important aspect. And at last, we have the pre-provisioning resources that are monitored. So pre-provisioning is a system that we have in order to um, pre-provision all our dependent resources uh, so that when there is a real creation request, we are not at risk of failures from any dependencies as we already have something pre-provisioned. So let's go to the other slide. And here we're going to talk about the custom metrics. So these are actually the metrics of each resource plane or each Airflow instance uh, that a user uses. And here, as you see, we're covering a lot of metrics like the status of the flower, the broker, the schedule, of course. Then we have metadata, status of the deployment API, and the overall status, of course. So if we go to the next slide, we will see how we uh, make this happen. We have built uh, internal plugin, uh, Airflow Health plugin, uh, which essentially calculates the health of each and every dependency, each and every module, and the overall health. And then what happens is that this plugin exposes a sort of a health report to a URL. And, and then we have That's the export. Uh, the Airflow instance itself is not accessible because maybe there's an issue with the SLB, maybe there's an issue with network. So this really gives us an overview and gives us the outside the box uh, statistics. So we send all of these events to the event bus. Event bus is another private cloud service. And then a lot of subscribers can really subscribe to that event bus and get all of these events. A very good example would be the billing service. So if there is any change in the instance, like for example, the instance uh, is no more uh, in creation status, it has been deleted, or the instance is temporarily shut down, then its billing is also impacted. So it can be really helpful in those kind of, kind of cases. And uh, last but not the least, we have monitoring of our deployments. So by deployments, I mean the artifacts that the users deploy on their instances. And we have created a sort of dashboard to uh, really uh, analyze all the deployments, the reasons behind the failures, whether the failure is coming from uh, provisioning. If we pre-provision resources, they can be there. I can take advantage of getting a success and get and catch a little bit that combined SLA and reach a really production service uh, level. Second challenge we get is about the shared responsibility model. 
to be able to provide an airflow and to run airflow, we have to make a kind of moral contract with our users because the responsibility of running an airflow in production have to respect a lot of um, constraint. So we have some of responsibility like the network security availability, but after that, it came the, uh, the gray zone I talked about it. So if we talk about data security, so who is responsible? Is it the service provider or is it the user? So I think it's really shared responsibility. I cannot put in logs, clear data. It's, it's gonna be a broken system. The batch management is the responsibility of both sides. I cannot force a customer to, to do patching, but I will give him a maintenance window to do it. And he have to respect that contract or we will uh, expose our service to security threats. Sorry. Uh, uh, we have to think together about benchmarking. Okay. We have to think together about benchmarking and capacity plannings to identify the limits of the airflow instances and to don't break the production because something we learned after four years of running airflow is that it is hard to make airflow running, but it's very, very easy to broke it. After that, we can talk quickly about the resource access management. So here the users are responsible about authenticating and habilitating uh, people to access to their resources. The artifact development, the artifacts quality, the dependency, uh, it's, it's a responsibility of, of the users. Finally, to monitor the workflows. As a future team providing a service, I cannot say that the workflow is behaving as the customer expected or not. So the previous talk was very nice one because I think that it's the responsibility of a user of our service to be sure that his workflow behaved as he expected. Having a DAG as failed is not a problem, it's not an error. It can be a problem, that's true, but it's not always the case. So I already uh, a little bit talked about scalability. And for that, what we decided to resolve this issue is to provide an API that allow to users to be able to be autonomous, to uh, scale up or down. Uh, there is a small box there, it's called KEDA. We already did a, a proof of concept and a study there. And we still a little bit um, expecting or looking for a solution for the scale down future of KEDA. KEDA is allowing us to automatically scale up or down the, the, the pods. And that's very, very nice with Airflow as we are working with a synchronous system. So imagine if I have 1000 tasks to execute. So I will provision needed pods to handle that task. And when I have only a few tasks to, to run, so I can scale down. And the problem with the scale down is that which pod I have to kill. And today there is some techniques with, that we are studying and we are working with astronomer to look for, for something, if they can help us to, to override that, that, uh, that challenge. For auto-remediation, today we didn't uh, fully get the auto-remediation system, but we provided to our customer the possibility to do a health check of their instances and to, pro to trigger a failover in case of problem. Finally, we, we arrived to the patch management. So it's a very big subject today. Uh, we are facing multiple issue on, 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 the, on patching multiple components. As we said, we have a Kubernetes component, we have Ingress inside it, we are using Nginx inside it, so we need to upgrade it. We are using Postgres, we need to upgrade the database. The operating system of the database have to be upgraded. RabbitMQ is the same thing. We have to think about upgrading the RabbitMQ version and its operating system. So we think about providing a maintenance window where we can have the possibility to patch that, but we have to combine all that patching component together to don't disturb or at least to get a minimum disturbance on the airflow instance of the customer. So to do that, we already started providing or developing uh, some workflows. We are believing on eating our own dog food can help us a lot. So we are 
providing some workflow that allow us to do this patching in mass and allow us to parallelize the maximum patching uh, together. So to answer the question, is that hard to maintain uh, 150 or more Airflow instance running at the same time? And the uh, answer is yes. Uh, but um, we have to keep in mind that we have a lot of challenges. We're still uh, working on high availability, security. We're still working on the performance and cost optimization and developer efficiency. So to go back to the first question, um, we are not using Kubernetes to say, oh, it's cool technology, let's go and put Airflow on, on it and it's gonna work by itself. It doesn't work like that. We have to think about uh, the user experience and to provide a lot of uh, tooling and a lot of uh, facilities to make them uh, working together. That's it, thank you. Yes. Hello. Have you built your own hand chart version for Airflow? Yes, we are not using the official chart. We are building our own chart because we are on private cloud and we have a lot of uh, specificities. So we build our own chart. And if you go back to the slide where we are doing the build factory, we have the Helm chart as a parameter. So we can get multiple Helm chart versions running with different Airflow version. I will give an example for deferable operator. We have a new thing that is incoming there to handle the deferable operator. So we have to upgrade the Helm chart. That is not the same for a previous version of Airflow. Thank you. 